I'm Brad Bauer, I'm with the Sheridan Community Land Trust, uh, and Kevin Knapp is our newish history program manager. Kevin's been with us for about a month and a half, so excited to have him here today to lead our Explore History. You might know this already, but the Explore History program is a partnership with the Tumber Valley Community Center and the Hub in Sheridan as well. Uh, it's funded in part by the Next 50 Initiative. Uh, Sharon Community Land Trust, we work on uh, connecting people to the land and history, so this fits under that component of our organization uh, where we can talk about these amazing historical moments in our time uh, from Sheridan area, and sometimes we go a little bit further into Sheridan. You are obviously here uh, for August's Explore History. I invite you to September's Explore History, so Tuesday, September 12th at 10 a.m. We'll, we'll be touring the historic Eaton's Ranch that's in partnership with the hub. Um, there's a handout in the back that talks about how uh, to sign up for that one. And then if you missed that and are interested in the same topic, we'll have it uh, on Tuesday, the following Tuesday, September 19th at 10 a.m. in partnership with TRBCC, we'll also tour the Eaton's Ranch. There's information on the flyer in the back mm -hmm. on uh, the sign for those. So we're looking forward to today's topic and looking for future topics. We're always interested in hearing what are uh, the, the histories that you find interesting as we're looking towards uh, which topics we'd like to dig into and develop into these explored histories. Or we also do have on Facebook, uh, our, if you follow us, uh, which is shared in CLT uh, as a community land trust, uh, we have every Thursday a throwback Thursday series uh, where we Explore usually in a couple paragraphs. It's also on Instagram as well. Um, some of the history of the area. You might have heard some of it at Explore History, but often it's something new. So. Yeah, I mean, if we have to do it every week, that's a lot of uh, work. And so if you have a fun story to tell, you come talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I guess, and the only other thing, I'd invite you to our uh, September 9th in Bloom. It's a, it's a fundraiser, but it's free to attend. It's a shared college. It's at uh, 6.30 p.m. Um, at the Whitney uh, building there. And we'll have Dr. Matt Kaufman, which he's one of the founders of the Wyoming Migration Initiative at the University of Wyoming. And he'll come and speak about wildlife movements across uh, Wyoming. Um, like I said, it's three, three to 10. Come have some uh, heavy hors d'oeuvres and drinks and get to enjoy his expertise. Um, but without further delay, I'll give you Kevin. So. Okay, well, I have Kevin now, um, and this is my first Explore History uh, that I've uh, kind of helped organize, but also that I've presented. Uh, so you guys have the honor of <laughs> getting me uh, fresh. Um, and this one in particular, I'm really excited about. Um, I wasn't gonna let anybody else do this one. I just thought it was really interesting. Uh, and I, and I kind of got obsessed and learned everything I could about this. Um, so, let's go on to the next slide, please, and start. Uh, so who were the Iron Riders? And that's a question that can only be answered with an understanding of what the Great Bicycle Experiment was. Uh, so during the 1890s, the invention of the bicycle was seen as a new symbol of personal freedom uh, for ordinary people of America without having to uh, own a horse, a carriage, a or, use a or ride a train. Uh, and so the Great Bicycle Experiment, when we say that, we're referring to a series of military tests uh, with the 25th Infantry Regiment. Um, and the longest test traveled through Sheridan County on their way to St. Louis. So that, that's why we are talking about it. Um, much of the documentation from the trip comes from a journalist, uh, Eddie Booz from the Daily Missoulian, who was along on the trip. Uh, but there's really very minimal information from the perspective of the actual uh, black soldiers, the Buffalo soldiers, uh, the 25th Infantry. Um, so they, we, they were called the Iron Riders from, obviously from the heavy iron uh, bikes that they were using, the frames, but also just, you know, metaphorically in the, the iron will that they showed in completing this 1900 mile journey over 41 days in five states. 
uh, and this, a lot of this uh, research comes from, there was a lot of renewed interest last year in this because it was the 125th anniversary. And so uh, a lot of fresh research kind of came up because of that last year. Okay, uh, next slide please. The, uh, the 25th Infantry Regiment arrived in Fort Missoula in May of 1888. Uh, it's one of four created after the Civil War that were, that were segregated, made up of black soldiers with white officers. Uh, the black regiments mostly served on the western frontier, known as Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, they were expected to fight against Plains Indians, capture cattle rustlers and thieves, protect settlers, stagecoaches, wagon trains, and railroad crews, and also to protect the forts. Uh, so our story with the Iron Riders and the 25th Infantry begins at Fort Missoula, Montana. Next slide, please. Uh, Fort Missoula was established as a military post in 1877, and it was a major outpost for the region. It never had any walls. It was an open fort, which was a common design for Western forts. Um, and the 25th Infantry Regiment uh, arrived in May of 1888. Next slide, please. Today, the, the historical museum at Fort Missoula is a 32-acre historic park with over 20 historic structures and a collection of over 50,000 artifacts. So I would like to go after having learned about it. Next slide, please. OK, so <clears throat> maybe we're sliding a little bit off there. Just let me know if you have any trouble reading anything. Um, so the Lieutenant James Alfred Moss was, the, was in, in charge of Fort Missoula, and he was in charge of the Bicycle Corps. Um, in 1894, Moss, at 22 years old, was the youngest to ever graduate from West Point, but he also ranked dead last among his classmates, which meant he did not get to choose his assignment, and he was sent to Fort Missoula. <laughs> Uh, and the bicycle experiment started soon after. He was tasked by General Nelson Miles to see if the newly invented safety bicycle, which had two wheels of the same size and a chain drive, could be useful to the military. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in the early 1800s, we had the first bicycles, bicycles being manufactured in Germany and France. This is a Dreisine or a Loth machine, running machine, uh, from 1820, uh, invented by Baron Karl von Dreis in Mannheim. Uh, so because it was the first means of transport to make use of the two-wheeled principle, it's, it's kind of the, it's regarded as the archetype of a modern bicycle. And it's interesting because if you look at this one, it actually looks more like a modern bicycle than some of the later ones. Like if we go to the next slide where, you know, this is from Cheyenne. And those are similar to penny farthings. I guess we have some penny farthings in the back there. See that? But we also have some weird trikes with a. So throughout the 19th century, after that Lauf machine, they just started experimenting with different configurations of wheels and stuff. So, um, but then the next slide. Uh, so the safety bicycle was by 1885 pretty common. I don't remember exactly the date on this, but this is the Cheyenne uh, Wheelman's Association Bicycle Club. <clears throat> uh, and Lieutenant Moss was an avid bicyclist. So that's kind of where this starts to happen. Um, some people have questioned, they say, oh, OK, so they made the black soldiers do it because it's so hard, right? I mean, it's really more just a coincidence of this guy being super interested in bicycles and getting the permission to do it and being in charge of these certain soldiers. He would have done it with any soldiers he had. Uh, next slide. So this is, and this guy was a big part of it too. General Miles, uh, who gave permission, you know, who, who signed off on this. He, Lieutenant Moss referred to him as the patron of military bicycles. Uh, and he is quoted as saying, there is no doubt in my mind that during the next great war, the bicycle with such modifications and adaptations as experience may suggest will become a most important machine for military purposes. Um, and the reasoning here is, is there's a, quite a bit to it. The, uh, the main method of travel for infantry or cavalry, of course, was foot or horse, right? Horse has to be fed, 
has to rest, can be killed on the battlefield. Uh, men had to be spared to take care of the horses. And unlike horse tracks, you, you can't track a bicycle directionally. You can't tell which way it's going by looking at the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point in time, it was very common for European countries, actually. And that's kind of where we were getting. We felt like we were getting left behind a little bit because we, we had gone and toured and seen um, uh, Scandinavian and European countries utilizing bicycles on a, on a large scale with their infantry. And we were already using some in the National Guard and signalmen repairing uh, uh, like telegraph lines. So that next slide, please. So before the 1900 mile expedition that this is focused on, it, that was in 1897. In 1896, they spent the year getting ready. Um, and so usually they would try and make daily rides of 15 to 40 miles. But then they had several longer ones where they did drills and exercises to jump fences and forge streams, the sorts of things that they would need to do in, in combat. Um, the first one was from Lake uh, Fort Missoula to Lake McDonald and back. The second one, which was much longer, was an 800 mile round trip, was to Yellowstone and back. <clears throat> and I included quite a few pictures here. Will you go to the next slide? Because they're just. They're, they just had a blast in Yellowstone. Um, and they had to pick up rations there at Fort Yellowstone because it was such a long trip. And, and seriously, it was like this really whimsical trip. Moss had a camera. He's the one who's responsible for the, these photos. He said that he took a picture of a bear on a bicycle. Obviously, that would be up here if I had found that. <laughs> um, Several tourists came to the camp and took pictures of the Bicycle Corps. Soldiers were delighted with the trip, treated royally everywhere, thought the site's grand. That's what Moss's report on the trip. But let's go to the next one. And so you, you can see that they didn't have the same uh, prohibitions on getting close to the features in Yellowstone. Because <laughs> that, that's like a geyser, I think. <laughs> um, so, oh, but we were talking about tires a little bit before this started. On this trip was the first time they used any kind of pneumatic tire. Previously on all of their trips, it had just been wooden, uh, like an old wagon wheel, wood inside of a uh, metal frame, a metal, you know, rib, right? Uh, they, they tested something called the Advance from the Spalding Company, a new tire made of felt, rubber, and steel supposedly puncture proof. And Moss said, well, we shall give it a very severe test over some of the roughest roads in the country. And, but he was very interested in these tires because basically they ate tires for breakfast. Those wooden ones, two miles in, they were just shredded to the bone on their daily rides. <clears throat> and so uh, these guys in particular, these 20 guys, probably advanced bicycle tire technology in one year's time, you know, faster than they ever would have otherwise. Uh, so, next, please. So Moss, after his preparations in 1896, he sent a final report to General Miles. They met in the winter of 1896, and uh, Miles encouraged him to make a plan for a, an extensive trip in 1897. And he strongly believed the bicycle had uh, potential value as a military tool. So he sent a proposal to the Secretary of War asking one to be placed on a special duty in Washington until April 15th so he could study the literature on bicycles at the Bureau of Information and visit leading bicycle manufacturers and tire factories. Two, to organize a bicycle corps of 20 soldiers and one surgeon. To select the members of the corps from among soldiers stationed at Fort Missoula. Uh, four, to make a trip to Fort Missoula, from Fort Missoula to St. Louis and return carrying arms, ammunition, and rations. And five, to secure the needed bicycles from the manufacturer at no expense to the government. So Moss envisioned the most thorough and extensive military bicycle experiment ever made in the United States. He, he wrote, the main object of the 25th United States Infantry Bicycle Corps was to thoroughly test the bicycles in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, where if the utility of the bicycle for military purposes could be established, there could be no doubts about its practic practicability anywhere else. Next slide. <clears throat> And so the Great Bicycle Experiment used the 1897 Spalding Special Model 922. 
The Spalding Company had already provided the bikes earlier in 1896. These were basically the same model, better tire, a few improvements, and they gave them 20 of them for this longer trip. Um, and they had chain cases fitted to the bikes, and actually a lot of the modern ones like this one don't have those anymore, but let's go to the next slide. You can see them in that picture. Um, <clears throat> and that was really important. Keep your chains safe from getting a bunch of mud and, and gunk in there. And let's go on to the next one too. You can see it again in these photos. Um, and this is a reenactor from, from last year's <clears throat> celebrations. Uh, so let's see. So we'll talk a little bit about the detail of the bikes. And as I've said already, remember these aren't modern aluminum, carbon fiber type bikes. These are huge steel body deals. Um, and this, these were made especially for the bicycle core and were considered state of the art. Um, let's go to the next slide here. Um, it cost about 75 bucks. I haven't actually done the inflation on that, but probably quite a bit more now. Um, they had steel rims, tandem spokes, Goodrich rubber non-puncturable tires, which were not non-puncturable, they found out, but still. Um, heavy side forks and crowns, gear cases, luggage carriers, frame cases, brakes, top of the line Christie anatomical bike seat. Yes. Seriously, there's like huge spreads in the newspapers about the doctors talking about how special these are. Uh, and the cyclometer, the Spalding cyclometer, as you can see, that's their odometer. Uh, they were geared to 68 inches, weighed 25 to 32 pounds, depending on which reference we're looking at. And so the average weight with all the packed gear was 60 pounds. Uh, next slide. So, no, back. <laughs> there we go. Um, so then they had a whole system for packing these things, right? So the knapsack was strapped to the handlebars on the front. On the knapsack was carried the blanket roll containing one blanket, one shelter tent half, and for the tent poles, the haversack was carried either on the front of the knapsack or on the horizontal bar. A tin cup was secured under the saddle seat and protected from mud and dust by a cloth bag, the canteen and cartridge belt were on the body of the soldier. Every other soldier carried a rifle strapped horizontally on the left side of his bike. And those not so armed carried revolvers and had canvas luggage cases in the diamond frame of their bicycles. So then as far as rations, <clears throat> flour, salt, sugar, coffee were carried in rubber cloth bags and stored either in the knapsacks or the luggage cases. Bacon was cut into small chunks wrapped in cloth. Canned goods such as corn, baked beans, jelly, deviled ham were generally carried in the knapsack. The cooking utensils consisted of dripping pans, a baking pan, and a large coffee pot, which were carried in a tin case attached to the front of the bicycle, resting on the frame. So this is not loaded up. You can imagine there's a lot more gear on here. And actually, I think by the time they got to Livingston, they'd already broken all their coffee pots from the way that they stored it on the front like that. Um, and then every soldier, so I mean, they're making this knapsack seem like it's a bottomless, like Mary Poppins sort of thing, like just shoving everything in there. Because uh, here, it, that's their gear they're sharing, right? Now for each personal person in their knapsack, one summer undershirt, one pair of summer drawers, two pairs of summer socks, a towel, two handkerchiefs, winter undershirt, winter drawers, one pair of winter socks, one toothbrush, one cake of soap, one blanket, toilet paper. And this is something that I've seen in different places. This one says every other man carried a comb and brush. I've also heard that they only had two combs and brushes for all 20 of them. <clears throat> um, and then they had their own knives and forks and spoons. Uh, so then, yeah, let's go to the next one. This guy, though, uh, was really important to them. And he is one of the soldiers who's mentioned quite often because he was their mechanic. Um, and you can see his bike is different. He's got a toolbox attached to the front there. So a Missouri native, John Finley, uh, his army enlistment records show he was born in Carrollton, Missouri in 1874. He was reported as being a crack writer and boss repairer by a St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper article. He gained his expertise as a bicycle mechanic from four years working for the Imperial Bicycle Works in Chicago. And his skill at repair and writing were complimented by Moss in his notes often. When a bicycle would break down, he would go to the guy, 
give him his bike, stay behind his toolbox, fix it, and then catch up with everybody. <clears throat> so next slide. All right, so now we're to the big, the big journey, a 41-day journey from Fort Missoula, Montana to St. Louis, Missouri, 1,900 miles traveled through Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Missouri. <clears throat> They left Monday, June 14th, 1897, and arrived in St. Louis on July 24th, 1897. To, once again, in history we find that there's different sources that get different numbers. Some sources say up to 40,000 people, but there were certainly thousands of people uh, that witnessed the end of the Great Bicycle Experiment. Uh, next slide, please. So this is Lieutenant Moss's um, map that he drew in preparation for the for the route. And he broke up the journey into four stages. <laughs> One, the beautiful rivers, colossal mountains, and fertile valleys of picturesque Montana. Two, the dreary yet fascinating lands of northwestern Wyoming and South Dakota. <laughs> Three, the barren, godforsaken sand hills of Nebraska. <laughs> Later on, her rolling hills and immense wheat fields. And four, the waving cornfields of historic Missouri. He had the quartermaster travel ahead by railroad and place rations every 100 miles. So they were using the railroad as their, as their guidepost and also to resupply. Uh, but, but still, he was pushing the men. The goal was by giving each unit only two days worth of supplies on their bikes, it would motivate the men to have to pedal at least 50 miles a day if the rations were spread out every 100 miles. Uh, all right, next. Uh, not, this is a modern you know, version of it. And this is actually from a bicycle uh, planning site. This was uh, the map used by some reenactors when they actually rewrote mm -hmm. the route. Uh, but we'll, we'll see more about that next, please. And then we'll see more of this, too. This is just a quick overview of the route that they took when they were here in Sheridan County. But we'll, we'll definitely break that up and see more of that here soon. Uh, next slide. Okay, and so these are the three white guys that <laughs> that that accompanied. So it's twenty, the twenty soldiers plus these three guys, and that was that was the company. Uh, so that's that's Moss, that's Lieutenant Moss, um, and as I already told you, he kind of got sent out to Fort Missoula uh, against his wishes. Maybe um, it was not considered a desirable post. Uh, and I mean that's part of also why the black soldiers were sent there, not necessarily to get them. Uh, the Union was very used to having black soldiers and very supportive of them, but they were trying to keep them away from the general populace by sending them to remote areas because people were very discriminating against uh, blacks in uniform. Uh, but he was born in Louisiana, you know, so he, he was a product of his time. And he often used stereotypical language in his reports and journals, uh, talking about the soldiers. Um, but it's interesting, he had a long career. This was his first post. And in his career, he chose repeatedly to work with uh, segregated reg uh, regiments in, in the Philippines and Cuba. And at the end of his career, he gave a speech about um, at his hometown, where he said, when I graduated from West Point in 1894, the Secretary of War assigned me to a colored regiment the 25th U.S. Infantry stationed in Fort Missoula, Montana. Being a Southern boy, I did not at first, I must admit, like the idea of serving with colored troops. But I was a soldier and had received an order from a superior, and there is but one thing for me to do, obey. After having been with the regiment uh, for a while, I found the men to be respectful, obedient, and good soldiers, and I like to have such men under my command. So he was, was an interesting guy in that regard. Um, and then the physician, James Kennedy, uh, assistant post-surgeon at Fort Missoula. Uh, he was, you know, obviously an important guy to deal with injuries or illnesses along the way. Um, but it's funny because Moss reported that he was an enthusiastic wheelman, but he himself told the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that he had to learn to ride a bike within a week before the journey started. <laughs> so he might have lied to Moss, and maybe Moss was just... <laughs> Encouraging. <laughs> and then Eddie Booth, this is a 19-year-old kid who was uh, also an avid bicyclist. That's why he was chosen, which is because he was really uh, into bicycling. Um, and he was a freelancer, but he was riding for the Missoulian on this trip. Um, and then 
people were picking it up and republishing his articles all throughout the country as it was going on. Okay, next slide. But as I mentioned, you know, unfortunately, we don't know as much about the individual soldiers uh, as we do about the white lieutenant surgeon and journalists. Um, but we do know a lot more now because of that 125th anniversary celebration last year. We did a bunch of good research, and it, we actually do have at least basic biographies for every one of the 20 guys at this point. Um, and we're not going to go through all of those today, but I just want to point out that that work was done. If you're interested in learning more, look at the um, uh, Missouri State Parks site dedicated to the Iron Riders, and they'll go into great detail about what they've learned about all these guys. Uh, but in general, they were chosen, uh, the guys who were chosen were from 24 years old to 39. They were all in top physical condition. They were from all over the country. Five of them were veterans of previous bicycle trials, but most of them had never ridden bikes before. Um, because of the unique nature of the expedition, Army regulations required that they weigh no more than 140 pounds and be no taller than five foot eight. Uh, but he did receive special permission to allow a handful of soldiers who exceeded those requirements. Uh, the heaviest soldier was 177 pounds, the lightest was 125. Uh, next slide, please. So the Iron Riders left Missoula on Monday, June 14, 1897. Uh, so by the time they hit Sheridan County, they'd, they had been on the road for nearly two weeks. On June 26, they entered Wyoming. Uh, they had crossed the Continental Divide, and they had endured near constant rain, snow, and hail, and gumbo mud. And of course, uh, next slide, they generated great interest whenever they passed through a town. This is Livingston. It's really good fun, too. <clears throat> um, okay, let's go on to the next. <laughs> um, this is from Moss's notes. And this is the night before they slept at Custer Battlefield. And I just found an interesting quote. He says, so far the country traversed had presented scenes of beauty, interest, and grandeur. As we rode from mountain to mountain, from valley to valley, from river to river, passing by the wayside relics of bygone days, we could but feel a pang of regret at the advance of civilization. The old stagecoaches have crumbled into ruins. The mountain teamsters and the buffaloes have disappeared. The Indians are passing away. The wild and woolly west is over. Those, those were his thoughts. At other points in his journals, he, he sounds completely opposite. He says how good it is to see the savage wildlands being tamed and all this stuff. That's just how he felt that day, I guess. Uh, uh, next slide. So as I said, they, um, they woke up in Custer Battlefield and the first day they entered into Wyoming. And this is, let's see. from Booz. And so I'll kind of go through and I'll share maps like you just saw and then some reports from Moss or from Booz's articles, basically. Um, and, and so this was Booz's story for the day. The signal to advance was given the next morning at 5 o'clock. The first obstacle met was the Little Horn River, which is not bridged except by the railroad. We were compelled to either ford or go out of our way and walk on the bridge. The latter plan was adopted and we were soon on our way in earnest. Good roads and no wind was our lot, and good time was made until the Little Horn River again presented itself. This time, we had to ford. The men took off their leggings and rolled up their trousers and waded in with machines on their shoulders. After a little delay, we were again on our way. The roads were getting poorer, and many washed out places were met with, and more hills. The Little Horn was crossed five times more, twice by fording, and the weather was getting extremely hot. <laughs> and sometimes they would... <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly why, maybe if it was deeper or something, they would actually have to put uh, like limbs across their shoulders and multiple bikes hanging down with the limb through the frame. Um, so, the Corps plodded along until noon when we reached Wyola, where we had lunch and a four hours rest. We pulled out at 4.30, the weather as nice as possible. But before we were half a mile from the station, a big storm blew up. Lightning flashed on all sides. The cattle grazing near were stampeded, and rain commenced to fall. A gallant run was made towards Parkman, Wyoming, where we were wet to the skin when the rain stopped. Or, we were wet to the skin. When we crossed the state line, which is marked with the barbed wire fence, the sun was shining, and the rain had soaked in, leaving a good road. 
We were glad to get out of Montana where rain was our continual annoyance and especially glad to get out of the Crow Indian Reservation over which we had traveled since leaving Billings. The Corps pulled into the park at 7 o'clock and made camp for the night. On account of rain, a dry shelter was looked for and resulted in our sleeping in a barn. So, they were under the impression that Wyoming was going to be better. <laughs> um, let's go to the next slide. So then this is the next day. <clears throat> and actually, our, our, what I'm going to read now was a letter that, that Eddie Booz wrote to his mom. So this isn't actually something he published. Uh, and he's writing from, he sent the letter from the Sheridan. We arrived here shortly after 11 o'clock AM, traveling a distance of 28 miles thus far today. The first 13 miles were simply awful on account of mud and rain. See, already Wyoming is disappointing. Right? <laughs> but the balance was mostly downhill and on a road as smooth as a pavement. Some of the soldiers' wheels ran away, and one of them was badly damaged. Fortunately, Lieutenant Moss had a frame here, and we'll soon be fixed up. The weather looks bad, and the chances are that we will not start this evening. Our average run up to date, including two days on which we did no riding at all, is 41 miles per day, or over 60 miles per day for days actually traveled. This is Buffalo Bill's Hotel the Sheridan, and it's pretty good. The doctor, Lieutenant Moss, and myself ate dinner here, the first square meal we've had for some time. At Fort Custer, had a good board, but too dainty for our appetites. We will be out two weeks tonight and have one third of our journey accomplished. The roads through the alkali districts of this state are as hard to travel over as are the sand hills of western Nebraska, but after that, our way will be smoother sailing. The flowers in this part of the country are much prettier and more varied than are to be seen at home. Red, pink, and white wild roses are to be seen on all sides. A flower much like the Montana Arnica flower, having pink leaves, are to be seen in abundance. They are pretty and have a nice odor. And he goes on to talk about how Lieutenant Moss ate three pieces of pie. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, of course, the soldiers were out in the parking lot eating rations out of a tin can. Let's remember that. <laughs> um, and then they traveled on to Warren Why Arno after, after lunch. Uh, next slide. And Moss. Um, summed up Wyoming as very dreary. The landscape was a monotonous series of hills with now and then an alkali flat and the water was abominable. Yet the dreariness of the country possessed a weird kind of fascination. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> okay, and then this was the next thing. So, where is this? This is from Boots. Okay. At sunrise on the 28th, the Corps was on the road. Fair roads were encountered until noon when we stopped for lunch. Crossing Clear Creek, the roads became worse and slow progress was made over the hills. One of the men fell and turned his ankle, causing him to fall out of the ranks and follow on foot. The few log cabins and station at Awato, he spelled our data really weird, were in sight at 8 o'clock, and a few minutes later, camp was made. Rations were awaiting us here and were issued after supper. The distance covered that day was a little under the average, delays being caused by waiting for our sick man to catch up. Before going to bed that night, one of the men discovered a few graves and heard that rattlesnakes were near the camp. That settled it. No sleeping around there that night, so it was decided to push on our way through the night. So that is a weird little couple sentences there that just goes by pretty quick, but it was really interesting. And some historians have called it inexplicable, others have called it disastrous, but they didn't sleep that night and marched on towards Gillette without having slept whatsoever because of a few graves and some rattlesnakes. Um, and so I'm entering into the realm of conjecture here, but I want to throw out there, um, let's go to the next slide, that our data before there was Arveda, across the river was a town called Suggs, which was uh, a hell on, town, hell on wheels town sort of deal. It was brothels and, and bars, and it was at the head of the railroad as it was being built, but they hadn't built a bridge there yet. And so the 9th Cavalry Regiment, another, another Buffalo Soldier Regiment, had been stationed there uh, as part of the military protection during the Johnson County Cattle. 
And the Stockbrowers Association had actually said in a cable to uh, US Senator Joseph Carey that they would prefer to send those troops as the colored troops will have no sympathy for Texan thieves. So these are the troops that we want. So they were using race in the way that they stationed these guys. Um, and also, there's there's a lot. They were hanging out with a stock detective that that people were infamous in the area. And so, anyways, people were already seeing the army as being part of the invasion, as they would call it, right? Uh, and so, the soldiers ended up being denied services at stores and barter shops. Uh, met with open threats, taunts, and insults. An argument turned ugly. There's some gunplay that day, and then the next day, all 20 of the troopers went back and started firing on the town, and the gun fight happened, and one of the soldiers was killed. I would think that with only four colored regiments in the army, that these guys might have heard of this. <laughs> and it only happened five years before they were there in this very spot. I just wonder if, if that had something to do with not spending the night there that night. <laughs> um, OK, next slide. I, I am going to spend a little more time, honestly, talking about this stage of the journey than I did the couple days they were in, in Sheridan County. And that's because this is just interesting. So much more interesting. Like, more happened uh, in the rest of Wyoming as they were leaving than, than did here in Sheridan County. And I just felt it was cutting off just before the climax if I didn't talk about these next days. Because like I said, a lot of people who studied this were like, this is the most disaster. Like, the whole thing almost fell apart when they just forced themselves to ride their bikes for 48 hours straight through the rain and the mud. And, you know, and it just got worse and worse. Um, so on, uh, on June 29th, this is after not sleeping, after having ridden somewhat over 20 miles up an almost continuous grade under the broiling sun, they stopped at 2 p.m. in Gillette for lunch. Many of the men were so tired they fell asleep while eating. At this point, the only potable water to be had was from the railroad tanks. A dispatch from Gillette stated, tired and muddy, the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps, Lieutenant Moss commanding, arrived June 29th en route to St. Louis. Wild Horse Creek near Arvada was a mass of mud. Hailstones which fell Sunday were drifted seven or eight feet high. So let's go to the next slide. And honestly, I was going to make fun of this kid because he's the first person that I read saying that they were eight feet high piles of hailstones. But Moss says it too. And so I'm inclined to believe they were at least a couple feet high. <laughs> um, but this was from that day, this kid says. This hard work was too much. It could not prove anything about a bicycle. It was merely a test of physical endurance of which tests we had quite sufficient. <laughs> Poor Eddie. <laughs> All right, next. Um, the next point along the route where water could be obtained was Moorcroft, 30 miles away. Being told at Gillette that the road to Moorcroft was very good and slightly downgrade, Moss thought the road could be easily made in four hours. At 4 p.m., they left Gillette. By 7 p.m., they covered 16 miles. When all at once, the clouds began to gather thick and fast, and almost immediately darkness was upon them. The road being entirely unknown, they were compelled to decrease speed considerably, and a few minutes later, one of the soldiers broke his front axle. As they had no extra ones, he had to roll his bicycle the whole way to Moorcroft. Moss then turned the Corps over to the acting First Sergeant Mingo Sanders, and taking with him one cook and two soldiers who had flour, bacon, and coffee in their luggage, they started out ahead, intending to reach Moorcroft an hour or more before the command and have supper ready as soon as they arrived. They had not, however, ridden more than four miles before the intense darkness and the condition of the road forced them to dismount and roll their bicycles along. While almost feeling their way along the road, wet and muddy from a rain of the previous day, they walked and walked and walked, pushing their bicycles before them. About midnight, they struck the Burlington, Missouri Railroad track. The night air was damp, chilly, and penetrating, and they were cold, hungry, and tired. The soldiers tried to make a fire, but could find no wood, and then they stopped to rest. About a half an hour later, the report of a rifle was heard. Moss had one of the soldiers discharge his piece in reply, and shortly afterwards, three soldiers who had pushed on ahead of the command and lost their way in the darkness came up. Turns out that uh, they had been following Booz, and he had almost led everyone off the cliff, and so they split in half over there. <clears throat> so they then resumed the march to Moorcroft. It was about 1 AM. Almost exhausted from fatigue, we rarely walked along a mile or two further. So it's now been 24 hours at least. Moss wrote, when a soldier, 
Okay, sorry, I gotta start that up. We worryingly walked along a mile or two further in Bosch Road when a soldier a few yards behind me exclaimed, my God, I, can, I can't go any further and collapsed. The rest of the party continued on. <laughs> the storm clouds cleared up and it began to grow lighter. Moss felt he was sleeping on his feet and began to hallucinate. And he goes into detail about that, but he was hallucinating. About 2 a.m., he was completely overcome from sheer exhaustion and lay down on the wet mountain side. And I don't think, I'm not sure on that time, I've, I've had trouble piecing it together. They say it got lighter, I think they meant the storm lifted. Um, but anyways, he was completely overcome from sheer exhaustion. He lay down on the wet mountain side with a shelter tent half under him and a blanket over him. He woke up about 4 a.m. and beheld about a mile off Warcraft. So they made it within sight and then collapsed. His body had made an impression in the soft, muddy mountainside, and the shelter tent was saturated with moisture. It took them almost an hour to travel the mile through gumbo mud and water to Moorcroft. They laid over at Moorcroft until 2.15 that afternoon. And then they traveled only 20 miles, spent the night in Marino, which is a little tiny town that does not exist anymore. And the next day they had lunch in Newcastle, slept in Clifton, another little tiny town, and then that was, that was it. The next day they were in the South. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, and of course, much that really set, you know, he had already talked about how much he was dreading the godforsaken sand hills, right? And now they're entering into it after having gone through this, and um, most of them are sick from the alkali water that they were drinking. Um, and so, yeah, Nebraska was just terrible. Like, they had to carry their bikes or push them most of the way or ride them on the railroad tracks. Uh, and actually, I think it's the next slide. Let's see what the next slide is. Yeah. In Crawford, Nebraska, they just accidentally happened to ride up into town during the 4th of July parade. <laughs> <laughs> and became an impromptu attraction in the parade. Um, but at one point, Moss became so ill that he actually had to stay behind at a hospital. I think it was in St. Joseph. No, no, no. It was before Missouri. I don't remember where that was, but he... Uh, he caught up with them from the train. But all in all, they arrived in St. Louis uh, one day later than they said they were. Uh, next. Um, and of course, I, I'm being a modern human. I'm thinking, well, where's the photographs of this huge like, reception in St. Louis, right? But if you think about the way that um, photography and news, news reporting has changed over time, this, that was, you know, photography was a novelty. And, and you would be more likely to have Moss out in the field taking pictures of guys on bikes because it's something no one had ever seen before than something like this. They're like, well, if you were there, you saw it. And if you weren't, we've got professional sketch artists to <laughs> fill you in, you know? So this is the, from the St. Louis paper, their coverage of this. Um, so on July 24th at 4.30 p.m., they saw St. Louis for the first time. A group of over 1,000 cyclists met the corps to escort them into town. A squad of mounted police led the men down Union Avenue to Forest Park in St. Louis. Um, next slide. Maybe. I guess I, I jumped the gun a little bit on that one. But, uh, Henry Lucas, the president of the Cycling Club of St. Louis, shook hands with Moss. Three hearty cheers went out for the soldiers. For the final time, they dismounted their bicycles and set up their camp. Our trip has ended, Moss said. I thank, you, I thank you for your fortitude. You will now rest your wheels and fall in for mess. Moss and Kennedy had dinner inside the cottage. The troops were treated to steaks and other food set out on a long table inside a bicycle ship. Um, so the expedition had been a grind, but Moss had proven his point to the army. They traveled the speed faster than both infantry and cavalry. He, he wanted to go on to Minnesota and get on a train there, but the army just told him, get the bikes back and get on a train there in St. Louis and go home. Um, and you might remember that it said the original proposal was to go there and return with supplies, right? I think they all just decided they had enough, <laughs> that they couldn't, they, there was nothing more. As Booth said, I think we've tested this, you know? I think we know everything we can know. But also the army, it was almost like in the time from when they left to when they arrived, the army was starting to look more at some other mechanical devices with wheels that became more popular. <laughs> um, 
So on August 19th, they returned by train, which I'm sure they really enjoyed that ride. Um, and this, so, so as far as assessing the, the bicycle experiment, I, I include this quote partly because I just find his chief, he goes on and on about roads in, in his assessment. And it might seem just kind of funny, but I think it's important. So there's no condition of weather we did not endure, no topographical obstacle that we did not overcome. We wheeled over mountains and deserts, over sand hills and good hard roads. And right here I want to say that the judgment of some people as to what constitutes a good road is sadly a false. <laughs> Frequently we would take some road to the suggestion of the residents of the town we passed through that it was all right, and we found it to be anything but decent. And he says that like four or five different ways, and so on. And I, I, I think it's funny, and I'm just throwing it up there because that, but also, this is, it's a weird time period where these guys got a glimpse of like what it would take to make a network of passable roads to travel all over this country which we're all very much taking for granted right now. And so this was this weird moment where they had wheels, they could see the need for a, a new road system, they could see the challenges there, but these roads that they were talking about weren't, um, in the end, gonna be fated to be used by bicycles at all. So I just find it to be a strange transition period. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so, he, we'll get to this in a minute. These are his official kind of things, but he measured all of the men compared muscle growth in their chests, arms, and legs. Somehow 14 of the men had gained weight during the trip. Moss assessed the trip in great detail, uh, critiquing which tires had performed the best, which areas of the country had the best roads. Uh, the trip has proved beyond peradventure my condition that the bicycle has a place in modern warfare. In every kind of weather, over all sorts of roads, we averaged 50 miles a day. At the end of the journey, we're all in good physical condition. 17 tires and half a dozen frames is the sum of our damage. The practical results of the trip shows that an army bicycle corps can travel twice as fast as cavalry or infantry under any conditions, and at one-third the cost and effort. So he outlined 14 points he learned from the trip, and these are just a few of them. Uh, men in future bicycle corps should have at least three years cycling experience. He, he was always getting mad at the guys. Every time they broke a bike, it was their fault, right? It was like, you were riding it wrong. <laughs> um, all luggage should be carried on the bike, not the soldier, like swinging around. Right? Um, brakes were a necessity. You might think they were happy when they got over the rise, but no, they were scared to death going downhill. Um, the complaint of every cyclist, the wind, is one of the worst and most discouraging things to contend with. That was just a commentary. I don't think he had any solution to that. And a bunch of, he, he really scientifically had a bunch of new specifications for the bicycle design. Um, but, and then he did a bunch of math where he went through days they were traveled, days they weren't traveling, third of a day that they were down, hours repairing bicycles, all of that, and broke it all out to say that there was 34 days an average of 55.9 miles per day. So 34 days of travel uh, at 6.3 miles per hour. Um, the St. Louis Globe Democrat quoted Moss as saying that on average, the Corps had to dismount every seven miles because of road conditions. He estimated they walked between three and 400 of the 1,900 miles. Some of the roads were about as good as dirt roads as could be found anywhere in the United States, while others were a disgrace to civilization. <laughs> As a rule, we found the roads an index to the people of the communities through which we passed. <laughs> Where the roads were properly graded and well worked, the inhabitants were well informed, used modern farming implements, had fine windmills and other conveniences. On the other hand, where the roads were in bad condition and evidently much neglected, the people were narrow-minded, devoid of any knowledge of the topography of the country, and behind the times in every day. <laughs> the bicycle will, I think, do more to solve the good roads question in this country than all other factors combined. Indeed, the League of American Wheelmen colors that flow from my handlebars were the messenger of the deliverance from bad roads. Um, but he does talk about, even though they had to not ride, he still talks about how nice it was to have wheels. The loads were on the bikes still. So they're, even though they're pushing it, it's not on their back, right? Um, and this is kind of his summation. Upon favorable conditions, the bicycle is invaluable for courier work, scouting duty, road patrolling, rapid reconnaissance, etc. A bicycle corps as an adjunct to infantry or cavalry could render excellent service where speed rather than number is required, such as taking possession of passes, bridges, and strong places ahead of the command, and holding them until reinforcements could be gotten from the main body. 
On the other hand, in rain, weather over bad roads, etc., the horse is superior. The very thought of the bicycle doing away with the cavalry altogether is ludicrous. Each had peculiar functions. The one is not superior to the other. The question, therefore, which confronts us is, should not a modern up-to-date army have both? That it might avail itself of the advantages of the one or the other as the proper conditions present themselves? So then back at Port Missoula, Moss wrote a report about the trip and had it dispatched to the War Department saying the durability as well as the practicability of the bicycle as a machine for military purposes was most thoroughly tested under all possible conditions except that of being under actual fire. Um, and he had bigger plans. He began forming an expedition that would travel to San Francisco. And part of that actually was sort of a PR sort of thing where the army thought it might be time to start showing more um, urban cosmopolitan populations uh, colored soldiers. Um, but the War Department turned down that project. Uh, they said sufficient experiment, experiments to meet all knowledge of its merits have been made with the bicycle at present. <laughs> and then it was moot because uh, the beginning of the Spanish-American War. And the 25th Infantry was, this was one of the first to go. Uh, this is them leaving Missoula <coughs> for the Spanish-American War. Uh, they were heading to Tampa, Florida. They were marching across the Higgins Bridge in Missoula. Um, so they were the first regiment, actually, to, to go to the Spanish-American War. And Moss went as well and led the 24th Infantry, another black unit. Um, and so here's, let's see the next slide. I just wanted to include a couple more pictures because they're rare. These are the guys. Uh, in Cuba, or the Spanish-American War. Next, please. This is their band, a cute little dog. And then the next is their baseball team. And those are just some cool photos to just kind of give us a look at some of these guys. Um, let's see, let's go to the next one. Okay. These are a part of that research from Missouri. And the, unfortunately, they aren't identified. These are all just anonymous members of the 25th. Uh, but we're just including them so you can take a look. Um, I will, I will, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the details of all their lives that have nothing to do with this ride. But there are, there are a few guys' experiences really worth mentioning. Um, for one, they actually, a newspaper, let's see, the Daily Iowa Capital, actually did interview one of these guys uh, on their way through. Oh no, let's see. It was afterwards. They got a hold of him afterwards. Um, and he just, he just kind of told all the details of what I've said, how hard it was, how muddy it was, uh, the sand hills were the worst. Um, while they had enjoyed the venture, said Private Route, they were glad to be on the return trip and going by rail instead of traversing the route again in the manner in which they had come. <laughs> so I thought that was a good little quote from him. Um, okay, and then there's Private Eugene Jones. He's the only guy that didn't finish the ride. Uh, and the poor guy. Uh, Private Eugene Jones was claimed to be ill and unable to ride and was sent back to Fort Missoula from St. Joseph, Missouri. And Moss says, I have every reason to believe this soldier was merely faking his illness and thinking that I would send him the rest of the way to St. Louis by rail. As he had given me trouble on several occasions, I thought it would be best for the public service to send him back to his station. <laughs> so I don't know what happened between those two, but, but he, uh, he got sent back when he was like two days from the finish. Um, okay, and then I, I will mention Sergeant Mingo Sanders. He was in the narrative at one point. He, he was. Um, a leader, you know, he had been a sergeant previous to this and was very um, important at, at the, the fact that they completed this ride. Um, he was one of the oldest guys there. And the reason I bring him up is because he, along with a few other soldiers from the 25th, uh, were involved in something uh, later called the uh, Brownsville Affair, uh, 1906. Stationed at Fort Brown in Texas. So you know, this is after the Philippines and, and 
Cuba and all of that. And they were having trouble with the townspeople because you know they didn't want black soldiers in town. There was a shooting um, at a bar. A white uh, bar owner was killed. It was pinned on these guys, and um, all the white officers stood up for him and said, "No, nobody was out of their bunk." Nobody's guns have been used. We don't know what you're talking about. But nobody believed them, of course, and so they were, all of them, were dishonorably discharged. And Mingo Sanders was 40-some years old, was two months from retirement with a military pension, and that happened. <clears throat> um, and, you know, it was one of those deals where years later they retried the case and exonerated everybody, and all this stuff. But they were all dead. So. <laughs> uh, OK, next slide. So there's been a couple different in incidences of honoring the Bicycle Corps. On the 77th anniversary, there was a, um, a, a re-ride of the route. And, and, it was, and that was actually, I talked to this guy. It was the forming, it was like at the same time that they formed their Black Studies Department and their Black Student Union. That was like their first activity. <laughs> as a group, was to go on this ride. Um, and then Mike Higgins, he's a, he's a teacher from here, from, I don't know, I can't remember where he's from, but he's a Wyomingite. And he's actually the guy, his blog of doing this in 2010 is what caught the attention of the interpretive staff over in Missouri when they started doing their stuff. So it's this whole weird kind of feedback loop where now I've reached out to him He's like, did you know I originally got that idea from a guy in Wyoming? Um, okay, next slide, I guess. And then, and then this is the most recent one, just last year, the 125th. Um, and, and this is the guy, Kevin Smith, who just first wanted to just do an event. He saw Mike Higgins' blog, said, hey, we should do an event. I think some of our state parks are in that, in that area. And actually, he's still riding this wave. Like, he just got back from a uh, grand opening at the National Buffalo Soldiers Museum in Texas of an Iron Riders exhibit. He gets called into uh, classrooms to teach kids about it. He's kind of Mr. Iron Rider now. Uh, when, like I say, he thought it was just going to be one event at a state park last summer. Uh, next. And so all, at the same time, this guy, Eric Cedeno, did this by himself. But uh, yet again, another person rewriting the route. And he, he kept people informed on social media. And you can see, you know, he did the same thing like I did. There's Booz's story for the day. He's posting, he's posting the historic information each day that corresponds to where he's at. Um, OK, next slide. This is just my, kind of my bibliography. Um, and. I don't expect you to absorb all that, but if you're interested, I can share it with you. Um, and that's it. One more slide. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I was wondering, Kevin, is this General Moss, was he the Moss Mansion and Nolan's family? Oh, my, I don't know. Is I haven't actually come across or? anything. What do you know about that? Well, it's been a long time since I've been there. I, I, I don't know. But okay. I, because if he went back there, or if his family's from there, Montana would have been such a bad spot to be. Yeah. Not from his no, but I mean, it being Montana in the same name, I might have some over uh, where the Moss Ranch was. That Moss was the one that the Moss Mansion was from. The Moss that over uh, by Devil's Canyon, Garden Basin, Conrad's, that's the Moss that is got the uh, Moss Mansion in Delta. And so there probably was some kind of protection. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. But. I have to say, you did a very good first presentation. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, you have a very good voice. Oh, you thank you. Well, we're going to face. <laughs> did I go too fast? The <laughs> one good thing about it is that you've got that for your uh, beer, so if you're ugly, we don't <laughs> Actually, uh, I have a comment. Okay. About I'm the one guessing. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, I received a catalog of uh, used military equipment. Um, a, a company that specialized in military equipment. 
internationally. Mm-hmm. And they were selling used Swiss Army bicycles. And the reason they were selling them was not because they were disposing of the bicycle core, but the, the, the bicycles were one speed. Mm-hmm. And they were upgrading now to three speed bicycles. <laughs> And the very idea in mountain country where the roads are like this or like that. One gear. Uh, I, I said to my wife, I just got to see the lights on these cars. <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, yeah, no. I, I was an infantry soldier and I thought I had strong legs. But the idea of riding that bicycle up and down the mountains. Right. And sometimes maybe not even on a road, like you saw that one picture came up a couple times where they're just in the field. The, in the, the, the idea was mind-boggling yeah. that they could bike. Yeah. And incidentally, uh, in a sense, uh, bringing history way forward, and there's a lot of history here, a lot, you know, but bringing it way forward. As a uh, uh, was a um, a strong reason for our difficulties in Vietnam, <laughs> the bicycle from North Vietnam through Cambodia through Laos carried more supplies down the whole Chinese Trail. Mm-hmm. Than our trucks to supplies wow. in the other direction. And that's been my sense is that the military did adopt the use of the bicycle in a lot of the ways he was talking about for reconnaissance and you know single two man little teams going to do this and do that. But it was never adopted full on as an infantry tool. Um, to this day, there are military bicycles for sure. There are so many reasons uh, why the 25th infantry uh, was harassed the way they were. Right at this time, the junction of history, the late 1890s, the Army Officer Corps began to be dominated once again by West Point graduates who came from the Confederate States. Mm. And uh, that, that changed any progress that black soldiers were doing. Sure. From that point on, it went down there. Yeah, and they definitely, in the later part of the trip there in Missouri, they were not necessarily very welcomed by some well, folks who didn't this, feel like the war was over. The 1890s, the 1880s was the rebirth of uh, Confederate. Uh, Dominance yeah. In the American military. Yeah, I could. I. I have. Yeah, I, could, I have seen indications of that as well. That for a moment there was some progress, and then it kind of was taken back. It's amazing that uh, out of the twenty soldiers, nineteen of them made the entire trip. <laughs> but I guess they wouldn't have had a choice. They would have been considered a deserter, or and then. How would they get back to it? They were soldiers, right? So, and that's what, one of the really fascinating parts of this to me is how little, at the time, anybody was fascinated with this or impressed by this, even the men themselves. That in their old age, with their children and stuff, they, did, they talked about a lot of things that they did. But this wasn't one of them. This was just one more job that they endured, you know? From our perspective, it's so unique. Yeah. And in part of this transition period, as I said, that it's worth noting. But to them, it was just what they were told to do. <laughs> you know? And it gave me a respect, well, not a respect, but a different perspective on bicycles myself, a thing that we take for granted um, as being, you know, a part of our culture. It's like, it's like learning to ride a bike. You know, it's just it's a part of our culture. But this was just yesterday. <laughs> it's really a, a brand new invention still in the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so what's really cool is that um, this isn't the end of our uh, storytelling with this. We actually have a, a grant from the National Trust uh, African American Heritage Fund to create, um, I don't know if any of you have been familiar with our GPS audio, audio tours, but there's a company called Travel Stories GPS, and you can use them to, to create an audio tour that's linked to GPS. So we have one for the, uh, the coal camps and the Black Diamond tour. So as you're driving around, it'll tell you where to go, and, and as you get to a place, it knows with GPS, and it starts uh, relevant uh, audio information. So we're gonna do a similar sort of thing with this. And so we're in the early stages of figuring it out. It's a very long route. Um, an 80 mile route for Parkland to our data, or well, more than that. Actually. So we're figuring out the, the details of how to actually tell it best. Um, well, so, so next year, next summer, we will be unveiling that, and I'll make a big deal out of it. It, it won't just be the auditor at that time. I'm going to try and have other. You know, some maybe a commemorative ride with some bicyclists or something. So just keep your eyes peeled for that if you're interested in this presentation. Um, know that that'll be coming next year. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you very much, guys. Thank you.